and for having me. Does does this, does this advance slides? Or no, 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 it's just it's just the keyboard. Or the keyboard. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for coming. I know it's uh, it's uh, not the best out there. Um, so I, either you, either you're really interested in PPIs, or uh, uh, you just yeah, you just you didn't know what the lecture topic was. I'm not sure. But either way, thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Um, I was uh, here also as um, one of the three experts for Charles's talk, uh, which was a uh, uh, there he is. Um, uh, which was a very nice uh, uh, overview of this topic, and I think uh, will reiterate some of the same uh, points that uh, Charles made, uh, but hopefully add some new wrinkles so that even if you were there, it's not uh, completely redundant. This is the central problem which we're all familiar with, uh, this apparent contradiction between the very high prevalence of use of PPIs and this apparent concern about adverse effects. So. The red line is data from NHANES. Um, NHANES, most of you or many of you are probably familiar with. It's a mobile survey, ambulatory, non-institutionalized adults are asked questions about their health. If they're asked the question, have you used a PPI within the last 30 days? This is uh, the most recent data that I could find from 2011, 2012. 8 to 10% said yes. So that's a lot of PPI use. You know, these are non-institutionalized adults, uh, pretty healthy people. You know, about 10% are using a PPI within the last month. A huge amount of use, and yet simultaneously, at least if you measure it by the number of articles published, this incredible concern, not just about one adverse effect, but about whatever adverse effects uh, you can name. And the gray bars are the number of articles published per year. And this is a little out of date, but if we continued this on through 2017, we would see these bars would be much, much higher. I'd say five, tenfold higher. So how do we reconcile? our apparent concern with the very high rates of use. And then there's the patients, and if you see patients in the office, they come to you with questions. They read about chronic kidney disease, they read about dementia, and they're worried. And you need to say something to address their concern. You can't just brush it under the rug. You could try, I don't think it'll be very successful. Um, what I, my take on this uh, aspect of it is that it's, it's sort of can be frustrating when people come to you and maybe the first thing on your agenda is not the potential complications of their PPI. But I don't actually think this is a bad thing for us as a profession, <clears throat> and I'll try to convince you of this. Um, so first, again, I see people who have not already been prescribed a PPI <clears throat> where a PPI is indicated. And I don't mind that. You know, I don't mind that the primary care doctors are a little more reluctant to prescribe PPIs uh, because it sort of gives me a chance to prescribe, you know, the best medicine for acid suppression if I've decided it's appropriate. So I'm okay with that. I, you know, that's fine with me. And then <clears throat> the flip side is if I think it's inappropriate, and we all know that it often is, it also, you know, it gives me a place to start the conversation. I can leverage some of their concerns, even if they're a little misguided. Uh, you know, I'm willing to do that. So uh, anyway. Uh, Maybe not the worst thing that people are worried about PPIs. So these are, um, this is a recent review article. Uh, some of the organ systems that have been uh, implicated in PPI adverse effects, it would be an incredibly uh, tedious talk if I tried to go through these organ system by organ system or adverse effect by adverse effect. I, I'm not sure I could do it in 45 minutes. So instead, uh, I'll try to look for more universal truths um, uh, you know, almost like uh, truths of epidemiology that transcend PPIs, things that you could take uh, from this talk, and when a new adverse effect comes out, you know, hopefully those truths would still be relevant. Where are these people? Hi. Where are they? They're across <laughs> Okay. Great. Welcome. And then uh, <laughs> we need to talk at least a little bit about the benefits, the benefits of PPIs, because whenever we prescribe any medication as physicians, we're balancing the risks and the benefits. We do that subconsciously, but if we have no sense of the benefits, how on earth can we evaluate the risks? And then this is the last sort of like throat clearing slide before we get into it. A few caveats. 
So this is just long-term PPIs. I'm not going to talk about short-term PPIs. We're going to assume for the purpose of this talk that short-term PPIs are completely harmless. Anyway, there's little data about short-term PPIs. Um, and then when I talk about these studies, I'm really talking about limitations, not about bad studies. I don't think these authors are careless or, or stupid. Uh, on the contrary, the studies that I'll show you are, I think, the best studies in this area. Uh, very carefully done epidemiology. It's just that epidemiology has limitations. And then this is like, it takes one to know one uh, uh, part of the slide. Uh, I've done a lot of these studies myself on both sides of the PPI coin. It's an embarrassing number of these studies already. Um, uh, so the limitations that I mentioned certainly apply to my studies as well as some other guys. Uh, this is probably the most important slide. This is from one of Laura Targonic's. Did you did you use this slide? David's, David's on there. Oh. Oh, David. Yeah, yeah, David Fallock. Yeah, of course, David. Yeah. yeah, David and I did a study while he was, yes, a great study. David did a wonderful job. Um, uh, so this is one of Laura Targaunik's studies. These are the studies that, uh, to me, sort of uh, proved, as well as one can prove, that PPIs do not, uh, do not uh, cause fracture. Um, it, it could have been taken from any number of PPI adverse effect studies, but it's the kind of table one that we see in any retrospective study that describes the population. And why is this important? We're looking at PPI users and non-users, and we're looking at them at the time that they're starting the PPI. So looking down all of these uh, comorbid medical conditions or these other medications, we see that the PPI users are always worse than the PPI non-users. PPIs could not have caused these differences because they weren't on PPIs at the time. They're initiating PPIs. So the point is that they're different at baseline. So why is this important? Because we do an epidemiology study. We're trying to understand the relationship between an exposure and an outcome. And if there's a third or a fourth or a fifth variable that associates with both the exposure and the outcome, it gets in the way of our understanding of that relationship. It confounds our understanding of that relationship. And we might get the wrong conclusion. We think there's an association when really there is not one. So let's kind of play this out. Uh, this is an example that has nothing to do with PPIs, but it's really it's a classic example from uh, sort of a, a, the Bible of Epidemiology by Kenneth Rothman. This was a study that was done um, in the 50s when there was genuine uncertainty regarding smoking and whether smoking was bad for one's health or not. And the way that the study was done is uh, the investigators went around a small town. It was a small town in England, and they, they went door to door. They classified people as smokers or non-smokers, and then they followed them for 20, 30 years to see who lived and who died. And these are the real results from the study. At the end of however many decades, the non-smokers had died at a rate of 31%, and the smokers had died at a rate of 24%. So, you know... Is there a typo? No, there's not a typo. There's got to be some, some trick, right? This is the real data. And of course, there is a trick. So it's just that the, the non-smokers were, were all old and the smokers were young. So when you adjust for or stratify by age, within every age bracket, the non-smokers are doing better, just as you would expect. But the age uh, confounds or gets in the way of our relationship. This is sort of a trivial example. Obviously, they've thought in these studies uh, to adjust for age. Uh, but it, the, the concept is not trivial. It's sort of essential limitations of these studies. You have to not only adjust for age, but all of these other variables. And the problem goes back to that sort of table one slide. There's too many of these variables. It's so hard to adjust adequately for all of them. So uh, let's look at PPIs and heart attack, uh, as an example of this, is not because this is sort of the hottest or newest PPI adverse effect, um, but rather because this story has had a little more time to play out, and I think we can look at more uh, other kinds of data regarding PPIs and heart attack to draw some conclusions. So if we think about PPIs and heart attack, if we were designing a study, like if you set out to do a study, there had been no other literature on this topic, you know, what kinds of other variables would you want to adjust for? You'd want to adjust for variables like obesity, diabetes, hospitalization. But you're looking at a big retrospective data set. Obesity, really, what does that mean? Well, probably 
the obesity you would want to capture is like visceral obesity, right? Isn't it visceral obesity that's really associated with heart attack? Not, not BMI, you know, football player can have a high BMI, but no, no big data set's going to have visceral obesity. You need waist to hip ratios or scans or, you know, some way of actually interacting with people to measure that concept. So you're going to settle for BMI if you're the epidemiologist because it's better than nothing. It's the best you have. But you're losing a little bit of information when you, uh, when you settle for that. Similarly with diabetes. Diabetes is a, a complicated disease. It's not a uh, yes, no kind of a disease. Someone's got a A1C of, you know, 6%, they're taking metformin. That person doesn't have the same risk of MI as somebody who's on insulin, you know, at an amputation. And, and yet, you may not be able to classify or capture all of those differences. So you settle for ICD-9 codes for diabetes and classify it as yes, no. Again, you've lost a little bit of information, and that little bit of information probably biases you against PPIs. Why? Because at baseline, the PPI users are always sicker than the non-users. And then I think the most important uh, either unadjusted for or incompletely adjusted for variable across studies is uh, the idea of hospitalization or sort of healthcare interaction. PPIs are like the flypaper of uh, the healthcare system. That it's, it's sad, but it's true that if you see enough doctors and are in the hospital enough, sooner or later you are going to get a PPI. And uh, the scenario that, like, we've all seen is some guy who's admitted for COPD or something totally unrelated to gastric acidity, you know, he's admitted to the ICU, prescribed a stress ulcer prophylaxis PPI, probably inappropriately, then it's inappropriately continued on the floor. Now he's got a, a long floor hospitalization, you know, he's bouncing back and forth to the ICU, whatever. The medicine team turns over 10 times. No one remembers why he was prescribed a PPI. Now it's time for discharge. PPIs continued. This guy's on 12 other medicines. He doesn't know why he's taking them. Next time he comes in with the COPD flare, now it's a home medication and it's continued. So the PPI marks this kind of acute health change that you may not be able to capture in your retrospective data set, even in your prospective data set. All right, so uh, going back to PPIs and MI, how has this story played out? We've got like, uh, you know, nearly 10 years of this story. Um, and it's, the story has come back recently, too, so it's still relevant. So this is one of the early PPI-MI studies from the late 2000s that kind of uh, set off alarm bells for a lot of people. <clears throat> uh, and the study was a retrospective study like we've been talking about. They got a big data set. They looked at people who had some kind of coronary event, and then they're following them for risk of death or a recurrent event. Important outcome, uh, reasonable population to study, sounds like a good study. Uh, oh, yeah, I should, I should add, the, the mechanism for those of you who uh, you know, don't remember is uh, interaction with clopidogrel through the cytochrome P450 system. So clopidogrel is activated by cytochrome P450 uh, enzymes. Uh, PPIs are inactivated by those enzymes. So you're, you're competing for the enzyme's time. You're using up some of the enzyme's time. It sort of sounds logical that there might be an interaction there. It, it sounds plausible. Um, so the bottom... Two lines, I think, are the relevant, most relevant lines. Uh, looking at people who are taking clopidogrel and either are also taking a PPI, that's the top line, uh, or the, the dark black line, uh, or are taking clopidogrel but are not taking a PPI. And if we look at the difference at the end of the study, it's a pretty big absolute difference. It's like a 10 or a 15% absolute difference. So important outcome, 10% absolute difference, we should care about this result. And people did care about this result. The FDA issued a warning. Uh, this was mostly related to omeprazole. Not that omeprazole is, goes through the cytochrome P450 system more than any other PPI, but just more people were taking omeprazole in this study. So everyone switched people to pantoprazole, though there was not great rationale for doing so, in my opinion. Um, it, people just didn't know what to do. Uh, uh, physicians were frightened, and so were patients. And then... Um, almost right on the heels of the FDA warning, uh, this study was published in the New England Journal. This is the Cogen study. This is a randomized study. Same kind of patients. They've had one coronary event. We're following them for a second coronary event. Same exposure. Uh, omeprazole and placebo, uh, placebo or uh, sorry, omeprazole and clopidogrel versus placebo and clopidogrel. The difference is here, the patients are randomized. So this is a uh, study designed to show that the drug is effective at preventing ulcer-related bleeding. Uh, 
So the patients are allocated the drug randomly. Either they randomly get omeprazole, they randomly get placebo, and we've got the exact opposite result. Uh, also, similar sort of event rate, too. So really, a very comparable study, except that one is randomized and one is retrospective. Uh, the y-axis also is truncated here, so we can be pretty confident that the curves uh, overlap uh, very exactly. Uh, as I said, the difference is that in the randomized study, all of these baseline user, non-user characteristics are going to be randomly allocated. It's coin flip. So if we look across this kind of table one of variables, look across these comorbidities, we should see that the distribution is pretty even, and indeed it is. If we look at the retrospective study, the study from 2009, the distribution is not even. All of these, basically all of these variables, like I said before, the PPI users are worse at baseline. The problem is not necessarily these variables, it's all of the variables that don't appear on the table, all the ones that they weren't able to capture in their data set, or variables like diabetes where they've captured it in their data set, but it's a yes-no variable. They haven't been able to really drill down on the concept of diabetes and sort of uh, fully explain the relationship between diabetes and risk for MI. So um, Cogent came out. I think uh, concern sort of waned, but people were still uh, switching patients off omeprazole onto pantoprazole if they also needed clopidogrel. The FDA never rescinded its warning. In fact, it reaffirmed the warning um, for reasons that escaped me. And then in late 2015, 2016, another study came out uh, saying that actually that original mechanism is not the reason why PPIs are associated with MI. It's a new mechanism. And they had some, uh, some uh, laboratory-based studies where saphenous venous grafts were put in baths of omeprazole or baths of other PPIs. And the, the contractivity or the sort of the twitchiness of these saphenous venous grafts uh, increased at high concentrations of PPIs. So based on these laboratory studies, they then went to a big retrospective data set. It was a data set only of people who had GERD. Same kind of approach. It was a slightly different data mining approach, but similar idea. And they found this very modest increase in risk for PPIs and MI. And this, again, sort of made all the headlines. Uh, it was in all the journals and all the e-newsletters that I get, that I'm sure you get as well. All of a sudden, people were worried again. So do we need to worry again? I don't think so. We have a randomized study, and the randomized study doesn't care about the mechanism. That's the beauty of it. The, the other sort of problems with this is that you're, you're taking this uh, uh, very non-physiologic uh, laboratory data, you know, where you're putting uh, ex vivo graft uh, in a ba bath of ultra-concentrated PPIs, and then trying to extrapolate that to humans. And it's just it sounds even less plausible than the original mechanism, the clopidogrel interaction sounds. Um, in fact, if you think about how PPIs work, they're in the serum for a very short amount of time. So any adverse effect that requires a high sustained serum concentration of PPIs is going to be pretty unlikely. You're going to have to convince me uh, pretty hard that, that uh, you're actually causing the effect. And this kind of a very modest relative risk is easily explained by the, the limitations that I mentioned. You don't need much confounding. You don't need many of those third or fourth variables to get a 15% relative increase in risk in a huge data set. All right, so that's PPIs and MI. Let's move to a sort of a different, uh, a different kind of limitation um, uh, with some of these PPI studies. <clears throat> so these are PPIs and pneumonia. Uh, this is a meta-analysis. We're talking about community-acquired pneumonia here. Lots of studies, maybe a dozen, 20 studies, most if not all saying PPIs are associated with community-acquired pneumonia. <clears throat> this also not the newest, uh, hottest PPI adverse effect, but one that I think informs our understanding of the difficulty studying PPIs. Uh, here's a study from the mid-2000s looking at dose and duration-based effects of PPIs and pneumonia. Uh, top part of the chart, uh, a DDD is a defined daily dose, so that's the equivalent of 20 milligrams of omeprazole. Um, more PPIs on a daily basis looks like more risk for pneumonia. That looks a little worrisome. And then we look at the bottom of the chart, and it looks a little bit surprising. The patients who've been on PPIs for a shorter duration, 
so less than 30 days, have a higher risk for pneumonia than patients who've been on PPIs for a long time, more than 180 days. So that kind of sounds a little weird, doesn't it? This is another study, uh, also from the 2000s, same kind of effect. Here we're looking at the days since they got their PPI prescription. It's really just the people who got PPIs within the last week who are at the highest risk. And then last study like this, uh, drilling down on it even more. In this study, the top part, just the new starters, just the people who've just started a PPI are at, are at risk. If you've been on a PPI more than 30 days, you have no risk for pneumonia. And then at the bottom, it's just the people really who've been on a PPI for a couple days who are at risk for pneumonia. What's going on here? So what, what I think and other people have concluded as well is that this is a phenomenon called protopathic bias. So this is a common epi phenomenon. This is when a drug is prescribed for a disease that's present but not yet diagnosed. So what's happening here is that people are going to see their primary care doctors. They have a cough, maybe some lower chest or upper abdominal discomfort, and they're prescribed a PPI. A couple days go by, cough gets worse, fever develops, they come back, chest x-ray is done, you have pneumonia. Did the PPI cause the pneumonia? Of course not. It was already present. It was just misdiagnosed as GERD. And you might say, well, it doesn't sound that likely a scenario to me. It doesn't have to happen that often to get this effect. These are not strong absolute effects. These are modest relative risks. So just like we did with MI, can we look at other kinds of studies to try to affirm or refute my hypothesis? So we can, again, in pneumonia, we can go to a little bit of randomized data. There's not a huge amount of randomized data for community-acquired pneumonia. This was a study also like the Cogent study trying to show that PPIs are effective, uh, not, that they're, not that they don't cause side effects. Um, this was uh, Nexium, but there were two doses of Nexium versus a placebo. Uh, equal uh, numbers of patients in all three arms, and the event rate for pneumonia was half the uh, event rate for placebo in this randomized study. Not a lot of outcomes, but still relatively reassuring. Uh, the, the hypothesized mechanism here is that, you know, PPIs change the gastric microenvironment. Maybe some bacteria go retrograde. They're then aspirated down into the lungs. So if that's the cause, wouldn't we expect it even more in ventilated patients? Ventilated patients, they're not protecting their airways, they're aspirating all the time, uh, high rates of VAP. Um, can we look at randomized data from ventilated patients, since ventilated patients often, rightly or wrongly, you know, are put on uh, PPIs for stress ulcer prophylaxis? So here there's more randomized studies to look at. If we compare PPIs to histamine 2 receptor antagonists, uh, no difference in rates of VAP. Same is true uh, looking at uh, studies comparing PPIs to placebo. And then, uh, can we interrogate the mechanism a little bit more? Are there any um, uh, experimental studies that you know, help us uh, determine how plausible this mechanism is? This is a study done in kids, but it's, uh, it's a helpful one. These were children who uh, had, most had cystic fibrosis, but they had some kind of chronic pulmonary disease. They were all getting a, uh, a bronchoscopy and an endoscopy uh, before and after acid suppression. So it's not a big study. There were about 30 children in this study. But it's a really nice study design because you're able to compare each individual to him or herself. So it's a, like doing a mouse experiment, but in humans. And so uh, what they're doing is they're, they're taking gastric and BAL samples, uh, checking the bacteria in them, placing the child on a PPI, or a few kids were placed on histamine 2 receptor antagonists, and then checking them again. Did they change within that individual? Uh, so the first sort of column is the gastric samples. If we look at the numbers, the, these are like the, the colony counts from gastric aspirates uh, after acid suppression, they go way up. Not that surprising, you know, the pH uh, is radically changed at the stomach by PPI, so you're getting a lot more bacteria. If we look at the kinds of bacteria that you get, they change also. And again, I think not that surprising, physiologically, you get a lot more oropharyngeal type bacteria, including some that could cause pneumonia, like staph and strep. But then if you look at the respiratory samples, there's absolutely no difference in the lungs in the number of bacteria or in the bottom part in the kind of bacteria. So I don't think this really bears, uh, bears out the hypothesis. Uh, so I, uh, 
MI, pneumonia, these are kind of like the older adverse effects. What about the new adverse effects? My patients are asking about dementia and chronic kidney disease. They've forgotten about MI and pneumonia, right? It's only the headlines that, that people read. Um, why, why aren't I talking about those? But I, I would say I am talking about those. It's just that these stories have a little bit, uh, have had less time to sort of play out. The same confounding variables, you know, variables like diabetes, hospitalization for the CKD studies, even baseline renal function are either not captured or incompletely captured in these studies and a source, I believe, for residual confounding. Let's look at least quickly at some CKD studies. Uh, this study on the right um, was just out a few months ago in gastroenterology. They're uh, following uh, patients for a new diagnosis of uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, these are all people who have newly initiated a PPI. The red line are uh, people on a PPI. The blue line are people who are not on a PPI. Mm. Looks worrisome, right? The curves diverge right away. Uh, but I'm a little suspicious. And then if you look at the, uh, the data on the left, the, this is another study from 2016, the Z study. You see that, that same kind of uh, you know, lack of a duration-based effect, this sort of protopathic bias type effect that we saw with pneumonia. The patients who are on PPIs for the longest have a lower risk, not a higher risk. Um, and certainly there's no evidence of increased risk with duration, which is what we should see if it was really physiologic. So there's almost like a contradiction inherent in these studies. These studies have taken out people who had acute kidney injury. So they've subtracted those patients from the data set, and yet they're seeing this immediate effect with PPIs. The, the, the most plausible explanation for that is that it's a form of protopathic bias where the PPI represents either a hospitalization that was not captured or a more severe hospitalization where they've captured the concept of hospitalization but not been able to drill down more on the level of severity of the hospitalization. So the PPIs may be marking patients who've had very long or very difficult hospitalizations and then go on to develop kidney problems as a result. Now you may say, well, what about acute interstitial nephritis? Didn't I read in the mid-2000s that PPIs were causing all this acute interstitial nephritis? There's a very nice systematic review in 2007 of the AIN cases. If you look through this review carefully and you apply the WHO criteria for uh, case reports, 12 of the cases meet criteria for being certain. Uh, WHO's certainty doesn't mean it's actually certain, but the cases are pretty pretty good. And if you look at those 12 cases, three of them are uh, the best kind of case reports where not only has the person been challenged once with the PPI, but the unfortunate patient has gotten the PPI twice and had the same uh, effect, the symptoms of AIN. So this is like one of those three case reports. Uh, older patient gets symptoms that strongly suggest AIN. PPI stops, she gets better. Gets, I don't know why, but gets a PPI again and gets the IN again. So would we, as physicians, give this person a PPI a third time? Well, of course not. We'd be crazy to do that. But AIN is a rare idiopathic effect. AIN does not explain the rates of chronic kidney disease seen in these large retrospective data sets. AIN is less than 1% of all chronic kidney disease. So I believe that PPIs do cause rare AIN, but they don't explain the results that we're seeing in these big studies. Okay, so... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, talk about what PPIs probably don't do. But what do they do? Let's go back to PPIs. So they change gastric acidity, and they change it really, really powerfully. Uh, gastric pH is down in the 1 to 2 range. pH everywhere else in the GI tract is, you know, 6 or 7. Why is gastric pH so low if it serves no function? Wouldn't that be foolish if we were designing an organism to spend all this metabolic energy making the stomach acidic if it was, uh, was without purpose. This is an electron micrograph of a gastric parietal cell. So all of the little dark circles are mitochondria. That's all energy, calories that we're expending to acidify the stomach. So uh, for 100 years or so, we've believed that there is a purpose to gastric acidification and that the purpose is antibacterial. And this is a study from 1927, where they're alkalinizing the stomachs of dogs and then aspirating bacteria from the duodenum or from the cecum before and after alkalinization. And after alkalinization, there's more bacteria uh, distal to the stomach, and there are different kinds of bacteria. This is 1927, so long before PPIs came on the scene. Then in the 1950s, 
uh, these two surgeons at Mass General were reviewing their gastrectomy and their vagotomy operations, and they noticed that the patients were getting a ton of salmonella infections. In fact, they then went back, they worked with the microbiology lab at the time, they realized that their operations accounted for something like a quarter of all the salmonella uh, in-hospital cases over a two-year period at Mass General. So a huge proportion, given that even back then, vagotomies and partial gastrectomies were not the most common operations. Again, long before PPIs. Uh, can we find some experimental evidence that gastric acidification or lack of gastric acidification has an antibacterial role? Uh, so these are people who have uh, pernicious anemia or who are taking or not taking a PPI, and there's basically a log-linear relationship. The more acidic the stomach is, the fewer bacteria that are there. Okay, well, that's the stomach. What about in the small bowel? This is a study doing small bowel aspirates. Same kind of study as the children's study um, where we're comparing people to themselves. So not a big study, but a, a powerful study design because it's an experiment. We're looking at people before and after PPIs, uh, which are the dark lines, or before and after histamine 2 receptor antagonists, which are the dashed lines. So after the people are put on PPIs, uh, five out of eight of them have small intestinal bacterial counts that rise above some of the common thresholds used for diagnosis of SIBO. For the histamine 2 receptor antagonist patients, only one of the patients uh, has their counts rise like that. None of the other patients have their counts rise. Can we look at retrospective studies? These, this is a meta-analysis, some of the retrospective studies looking at Salmonella and Campylobacter. Um, these, these studies have the same limitations as the other studies that we talked about, but the effects are strong. We're not talking about a 15% or a 50% relative increase in risk. It's a 300% relative increase in risk, a tenfold uh, relative increase in risk, a thousand percent. Okay, well that's the uh, more of the small bowel or maybe the terminal ileum, uh, but isn't it the colon where people worry about PPIs and infections? Isn't it C. diff that you hear a lot about? So this was a study, uh, this was the, one of the biggest uh, whole genome sequencing efforts ever. They took a thousand ambulatory adults, sequenced the bacteria in their stool, and then gathered all this um, metadata on these individuals. What medications were they taking? What comorbidities did they have? Uh, their demographics? Everything they could find out about these patients uh, or about these uh, volunteers. They put it all into a big data set, and they asked the question, how much of the bacterial variability, this is in the stool, can we explain with all of our data about these patients? What they found is that they, they couldn't explain most of it. So 80% uh, went unexplained. But the 20% that they were able to explain, they then ranked which variables explained the most, that is the most bacterial differences. And PPIs, if you look at the list of medications, absolutely at the top of the list. And this is fecal bacteria, above even antibiotics. So we wanted to uh, test this even more directly. Uh, we took 12 healthy volunteers and put them on PPIs, collected stool samples before and after. Um, for our, our study, it was uh, 40 milligrams of omeprazole twice a day for 48 weeks. What we found is that they did not act like antibiotics. They didn't change the overall uh, bacterial diversity. They didn't. Uh, you know, radically changed the microbiome, but they did subtly change it. And the way they changed it most notably was the non-C. diff clostridia, probably the bacteria that are competing with C. diff for shared resources, did go down. So does this explain a risk of C. diff? Uh, to me, it does explain a modest risk for C. diff, um, but not a, not a powerful risk for C. diff. And if we look at the retrospective studies, they would seem to bear that out, a relatively modest increase in risk you know, 50, 75 percent, not that sort of threefold, tenfold risk that we see higher up in the GI tract. And in fact, if we order these sort of GI or enteric infections by their proximity to the site of PPI action, we again see this like kind of linear relationship. The closer you are to where PPIs work, the more they seem to uh, cause whatever infectious outcome we're looking at. Uh, I should point out that the absolute risks we're talking about are exceedingly low. You hear a lot about C. diff infection, uh, but the truth is that uh, it's still relatively rare, especially in patients who aren't also on antibiotics. So how many PPIs would I need to prescribe to cause one extra case of C. diff? You'd need to prescribe 4,200 patient years 
of PPIs. That's a lot of PPIs. If you want to cause one extra case of Campylobacter and Salmonella, it's 1,800 patient years. Because we live in a hygienic world, and even though Campylobacter and Salmonella are not rare infections, they're just they're not that common. If we're talking about uh, healthcare-associated or hospital-acquired C. diff, it's uh, 1 in 2,200 hospitalizations. These numbers all do go up, uh, or they go down. That is, the number needed to harm is, uh, 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 is higher in patients uh, who are also taking antibiotics. And this point is worth emphasizing. It's not just for, for C. diff or for Campylobacter, but whenever you have a, a weak relative risk in a really big study, you have a low absolute risk. All right, so most of the time spent on the adverse effects, uh, but we have to talk at least a little bit about benefits or how can we balance the risk with the benefits. So in the PPI guideline that we put together recently, these are the benefits that we were asked to focus on. Uh, so-called complicated GERD, NSAID bleeding prophylaxis, and Barrett's. And the reason we were asked to focus on these is that these are perceived of as the best reasons to prescribe long-term PPIs. So let's look quickly at the numbers for these things. So complicated GERD, by which is meant uh, GERD with actual esophagitis or, uh, or stricture, the numbers for PPIs are really, really good. <clears throat> uh, number needed to treat of work to prevent recurrent esophagitis or recurrent stricture. And said bleeding prophylaxis, as long as you're selecting the right patients. Again, really good numbers if you want to prescribe PPIs. Number needed to treat is 10 or 15. Barrett's is a, a bit more complicated. Uh, I don't have time to really get into Barrett's in great detail. But the bottom line for Barrett's is that although uh, essentially everybody believes that PPIs do prevent progression of Barrett's, the evidence that they actually do so is probably not much better than the evidence of all these PPI adverse effects. So you uh, have weak evidence of benefit and uh, weak evidence of risk. Um, there is a study going on in Europe now where two doses of PPIs are being tested to prevent progression of Barrett's. But even though it's a big study, it has about 3,000 people in it, it may be null because whenever a new Barrett study comes out showing rates of progression for non-dysplastic short segment Barrett's, the rates are lower than the last study. So it may still be an all study. If you're talking about people with long segments of Barrett's or with dysplasia, I think it's different. I certainly push these people to take a PPI. Uh, but although I, like everybody else, do prescribe long-term PPIs in patients who have short segment Barrett's, I don't push my patients. If they say, I want to take a PPI, I say, that's fine with me. And I don't know, Charlie Lightdale does the same thing. Um, so the previous slide and the uh, instructions we were given for the guideline sort of made it easy for PPIs because we took the best benefits and kind of compared it to all these adverse effect studies. But we know that PPIs aren't prescribed for these, uh, uh, solely for these reasons, that most PPIs are prescribed for uh, uh, much weaker reasons. So what about the most common reasons for prescribing PPIs? Uncomplicated GERD. People who just have some symptoms of GERD but have a totally normal endoscopy. So this, again, a very, very complicated subject, which I'll sum up briefly. Uh, uh, and briefly, I would say that the farther you get away from typical symptoms of GERD, uh, heartburn, regurgitation, the less proven benefit you have to PPIs. And when you get to the very far end of the spectrum, people who have exclusively atypical symptoms, there's no clear benefit to PPIs over placebo. This is one of the uh, studies from an ENT journal that came out a couple months ago. Here we're comparing PPIs, that's the PS group, to uh, a Mediterranean diet. And they, in this study, they conclude that PPIs in a Mediterranean diet are equally effective at preventing atypical symptoms of GERD, meaning laryngopharyngeal symptoms. But I would say they're equally ineffective, and that if you had a placebo arm uh, that was a real placebo arm, probably you'd get the same effect. Uh, so taking people off PPIs takes time. Um, it's hard to spend, you know, 10 minutes talking about PPIs when you only have 15 minutes to spend with a patient. If PPIs aren't so bad, do I need to bother doing this? Why should I spend my time doing this? Well, I, I think you should spend some time doing this. Uh, one is that we can only make decisions based on what we've got, not what we might have in the future. And we have to keep open minds. What if a study comes out and says, well, actually, PPIs do cause MI, and the evidence is really convincing. We, we have to be able to revisit our opinions. 
So uh, we, we don't know. We can't have complete certainty. Another reason is that rare side effects, I mentioned AIN, I'd say hypomagnesemia is another one like this, where uh, I've read some of the case reports of hypomagnesemia, and they're very convincing. So rare hypomagnesemia, I think PPIs do cause. If you're prescribing the PPI for a good indication, well, you'll, you know, you'll feel bad, but uh, you were trying to do the right thing by the patient. If you're prescribing the PPI for a crappy indication, you're going to feel really bad. So uh, it's not common, but you'll feel terrible. And then I think actually the best reason not to prescribe or over-prescribe PPIs or to take patients off PPIs, because often someone else has prescribed the PPI and it's up to us whether to continue it or discontinue it, is that polypharmacy is really bad. And PPIs are a big contributor to polypharmacy. This is data from one of the CKD studies, the Lazarus study. By the end of the study, a quarter of the patients, more than a quarter of the patients, had taken a PPI. That's too much, too many PPIs. We don't need to use all these PPIs. Polypharmacy uh, causes medication errors. There's clear data that, that's, that that is the case, especially in elderly patients. Uh, and polypharmacy sort of demeans all the, the medications that actually matter. Patients you know, think that all of their medicines are worthless because they're taking a PPI that isn't helping them. So I've complained a lot about the uh, levels of evidence for or against PPIs. Uh, could we do better in the future? As I've implied, I think sort of mechanism-based studies are going to be helpful. You can do small experimental studies. Often you can look um, in sort of non-traditional ways at randomized data, looking at post-hoc randomized data, sometimes pooling post-hoc randomized data. And then if we only have retrospective studies, let's at least require stronger effects or more plausible mechanisms before we uh, fly off the handle about PPIs. The last take-home points. So it's not easy to study PPIs. We talked about residual confounding. We talked about protopathic bias. These are, in general, safe medications, but they're certainly uh, overprescribed or at least overused. And my last piece of advice, uh, I think this was Charles's piece of advice as well, is that if, if you're prescribing PPIs today, don't worry about the adverse effects. Worry about the indications. If it's a good indication, you're on, you're on firm ground. All right, that's it. Thanks.